Okay. Um, so I used classical molecular modeling uh, as opposed to uh, ab initio molecular uh, ab initio atomistic modeling, which which is widely used by uh, well, uh, ITMO people and uh, collaborators of ITMO. So we, with classical molecular modeling, we're able uh, to probe uh, larger scales, larger time scales, larger um, length scales. And these are just some of the snapshots from, from our research where the pores with the fluid, which we consider are on the order of nanometers. And actually these are the porous system which are tens of nanometers in diameter, and we're still able to simulate uh, all that on, on the atomistic scale. So I use ab initio modeling as well. And also, since some of my research involves mechanics, I use continuum modeling uh, using classical mechanics while uh, using uh, finite element methods. So uh, when I say well, introducing myself, I want to introduce not just myself. I, I want to say that I don't work by myself. Of course, I, I do have a group and uh, my group, uh, my lab is called Computational Laboratory for Porous Materials. And we started in 2016 when I joined NJIT. Unfortunately, I don't have any picture from 2016. It was just me and my first PhD student, Chris. Uh, so this, this picture is from 2017. Uh, where I had another, oh, Chris, another undergraduate student and two high school interns. Uh, this is 2018 when two other PhD students joined, Alina from mm, Moscow and Max from St. Petersburg, and two undergraduate students as well. This is 2019. Uh, this is 2020 during COVID. All the, you know, all the group pictures look like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, ironically, well, one of the people who is on this picture, he's here in the audience, which, uh, um, which is sort of impressive. Um, and this is the, the most recent one. Well, that's not only the group, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, bigger than that. But currently, I have two PhD students and two undergrads. The rest are, well, either alumni or, uh, or family. OK, so. Uh, I, I hope I got a I gave a little bit of idea of uh, who we are, where we are, and what we do in general. So I want to be more specific now, and I want to talk briefly about several different things we work on, and then talk in details about one of the projects. So first, uh, first thing is. Um, well, something which has been a focus of my research for a number of years now, a uh, phenomenon of adsorption-induced deformation. And while um, to give an example, I think a pine cone and the behavior of a pine cone gives a beautiful example of that. So when, when it's dry, the pine cone opens. When it's wet, the pine cone closes. So that happens because of absorption or adsorption of uh, water vapor and the absorbed water vapor causes, uh, causes mechanical stresses in the porous structure. And these stresses are strong enough to change, to change the structure mechanically. So a pine cone is a sort of um, actuator which works based on the change of humidity. And of course, this idea inspires people to, um, to develop artificial materials which would behave like that. So um, this, in fact, this picture here, it's not a real pine cone. It's an artificial pine cone made of porous silica, which behaves pretty much like, like a real one. And uh, I work mainly on theoretical aspects of this phenomenon, so developing the coupling between adsorption and mechanics uh, to be able to help uh, develop in new materials with, with this um, with these properties. And uh, another project I work on uh, together with a collaborator from uh, NJIT chemistry department um, is restructuring of soot particles in the atmosphere. And uh, you might think, well, soot particles are not really porous. Yes, they're not porous, but they're, they're nanometer scale particles with fractal uh, with this fractal structure, uh, which has a lot of surface and actually 
condensation of vapors or adsorption of vapors on the surface of these particles um, well is play, plays a um, significant role in the behavior. So soot particles, obviously soot is the um, product of incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and it's a strong pollutant and climate force. Uh, and uh, the, what matters are the optical properties of soot, such as absorption and scattering of light, which depend on the morphology of those particles, because obviously this is close to the uh, well, wavelength of, uh, of light. And uh, when vapors, different vapors, can condense on soot particles, they affect the morphology. And for example, while in some cases, soot, init soot which initially has this structure, can collapse into these globular structure. In other cases, it doesn't. And what we're trying to predict are the conditions uh, at which these uh, restructuring of soot takes place on a mm, microscopic level. Well, because uh, that's it's necessary to predict to predict the uh, energy balances for these systems correctly. All right, another uh, another topic uh, work on, and this is this is actually uh, quite a. Quite a nice topic, which illustrates why why we need molecular modeling. Well, many experimentalists say, "Well, why do we need it? We can do experiments, and while well, it will be faster and more reliable, and we can, you know, uh, we cannot worry about the precision of different force fields and so on." But there are systems where you don't want to do experiments. You're, you're, there are systems where you're not allowed to do experiments except for very, very limited number of labs, and the, these labs are not at the universities. And in particular, obviously, the uh, uh, prediction of properties and behavior of extremely toxic compounds like chemical warfare agents is one of, one of these things where molecular modeling is irreplaceable. So chemical warfare was banned for many years, and uh, all terrorists still continue using them and there is a need for protection, decontamination, de de and so on. And while well, if, you, if you think, for example, of uh, well, the protective gear, this, I like this picture, people use well, this, um, this protective gear of, uh, to, to work with sarin. Uh, and of course, of course, new materials, absorption, uh, sensing, and so on. Uh, these are the, um, the type of areas which are of importance. And what molecular modeling can offer? Well, we can simulate Zarin. We, it's not toxic when it's in silico. Uh, well, and we can also simulate the, the molecules which are often used in experiments in, instead of Zarin, uh, so-called uh, simulants. So molecules, we have similar structures, similar properties, but not that toxic. And uh, while well, we can verify our model on these non-toxic compounds, directly comparing them to experimental data and then use the predictions for Zarin uh, and well, other compounds as well. Another uh, project I work on is a project uh, with Colgate Palmolive. Uh, they, they have a, a big research center in New Jersey um, and they've been funding one of my PhD students for, uh, well, for a year. And, uh, this is related to developing new generations of toothpaste. Uh, I am not allowed to talk about all the details, but what, what, what we've been working on is um, identifying mechanism of certain additives in, in toothpaste, uh, how these additives work towards, um, to, towards helping curing the denting hypersensitivity. So, uh, that's well. Again, there are there are many things which can be which can be done here on molecular level and involve well, adsorption surfaces, solid fluid interactions where uh, where my expertise is. All right. Uh, last but not least, um, another another area of research related to porous polymers. So lithium ion batteries are obviously well. We all use them every day in many different devices. Uh, there's, you know, they're getting uh, bigger and cheaper and higher capacity and all that. And uh, one of the concern which still remains is the safety of the batteries. And although there's a lot of research on uh, the electrode material on the batteries, there is less research on the materials used for separators in these batteries. And these are the materials which, for example, 
Ball, uh, which were the, the cause of the problem with the uh, famous Node 7, uh, Samsung Node 7. So uh, separator can fail mechanically. And then in this case, you get a short circuit and uh, your battery, well, uh, can catch fire. And uh, therefore, understanding of the mechanical properties of these porous polymers used in the batteries uh, are, of course, of importance. And in particular, what, we're, what we've been working on is uh, studying effects of different solvents, because solvents used in lithium-ion batteries, well, uh, they were designed for, well, they were not designed to use with these separators and vice versa. And sometimes, sometimes these effects are not taken into account. And uh, we've been uh, we, we've been addressing uh, addressing this both on molecular and continuum level. All right. Sorry, before yes, I have like a couple of maybe nine questions. So first of all, absolutely. So I acknowledge that the ring it looks kind of like as a chiral molecule. Is it or not? Uh, well, I guess so. So I wonder if uh, every like chirality is that toxic or poisonous as well as a zero. So. Okay, I think I, I don't know the answer, but I, I can tell that any molecule which involves this group of um, phosphorus, fluorine, and oxygen. So Zoman has exactly okay. the same group, and uh, well, although. Zoman would have a larger sort of, um, uh, well, more more other groups on, on the other side. So so the, these these core of uh, uh, phosphorus and fluorine, what makes it toxic? So I'm sure I'm sure if you rearrange it a little bit, yeah. it, it won't change anything. So and, and second question is probably how can I say that the material is porous? Does it mean that the volume of like air is more than fifty percent of the the actual volume um or not really so for if we think of porous materials their porosity in terms of them in terms of the fraction of wood so porosity you can say about the, the, as a quantity is the volume of the voids divided by the volume of the entire material which doesn't have to be that high 30 percent can be still well, can have still a, a huge surface area if the pores are small. And this is where the most interesting phenomena are taking place when the pores are on the nanometer or um, angstrom scale. And they don't have to be exotic, new, fancy materials like moths. Obviously, moths are great, but even if you take pores material, which has been known for more than a century and has been utilizing all different applications, activated carbon, charcoal, right? This this porous material it still it still provides it still provides a lot of uh, huge surface area and therefore uh, it's useful for a number of different applications, filtration, separation, gas storage, and, and so on. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I have folks who are online. No. It's not yet. I didn't, yeah, I didn't expect that most of the audience would be online. Otherwise, I would, I would, you know, came up with some questions to make sure they're awake. And um, so I, we, we gave just, just, you know, for, for me, this is a little bit sort of surprising because at NJT in the US well, in general, we've been online for almost three semesters. And this is the first semester when we're all in person. Seminars are in person. Uh, all classes are in person and so on. And uh, I sort of thought we survived this, <laughs> you know, online era. Anyway, um, so let me jump into something which I haven't mentioned yet. And this is something I'm going to be talking in details. And this, uh, I, would, I would say, uh, well, this is the title of uh, our recent review paper which came out in applied physics reviews elastic properties of confined fluids from molecular modeling to ultrasonic experiments on porous solids so these are well different things i'm going to be talking about so molecular modeling ultrasonic experiments in elasticity of fluids in confinement um, so the motivation the main motivation for these uh for these project 
comes from, well, just in motivation for fluids and nanopores media in general, comes from the uh, well, development of unconventional hydrocarbons, shale gas, shale oil. Uh, the difference uh, with the conventional hydrocarbons and that is that the shales there have these nanopores and uh, this is what makes them, the porosity is quite low, uh, but the, the pore size is the characteristic pore size is range in, a, uh, in well, it's a quite broad range and uh, the smallest are in the, in the angstrom to nanometer range. And these are just a couple of examples of, uh, of SEM images of shales mm, where you could see pores of the order of, well, tens of nanometers, but there are pores which are even smaller than that. So when, um, when people, uh, well, geophysics people studying the formations, the geological formations, or they study the properties of the, um, of the samples in the lab, what they use, they use propagation of elastic waves in the medium to characterize it. And I'll, I'll say just, just a few words, well, on the very basic mechanics of wave propagation. So there are two types of waves, the longitudinal waves and the transverse waves. The difference is obviously in, uh, well, the direction of uh, oscillations um, with respect to direction of propagation. Uh, each of the waves is, um, can be described uh, in terms of the corresponding moduli. So longitudinal waves described in, with longitudinal modulus, transverse waves with a shear modulus. And well, another property which is well, will be the main uh, focus of, of this talk is the bulk modulus, which while well, the same as hydrostatic modulus, which cannot be probed directly, but can in, in, um, in these experiments, but uh, that modulus can be related to the longitudinal and the shear modulus. So um, if we're dealing with a porous material, with a porous media, uh, there are different moduli involved. So first of all, the porous, porous material can be described in terms of the modulus of the entire uh, pore structure, right? Uh, pore, entire pore structure, I call it key knot, the modulus of the dry pores material. Well, that is very different, of course, from the modulus of uh, what uh, geologists would call grains, right? Uh, well, I wouldn't call it grains, I would say it's a uh, modulus of the pore walls, but these are two very different properties. Um, another property involved when we get fluid in the pores would be the modulus of the fluid. And then if we have these porous material filled with a fluid, of course, we can talk in turn, uh, we can talk about the, the modules overall, the modules of the saturated uh, porous structure. And uh, well, obviously for macroporous porous media, um, uh, the relations between uh, the modules of these saturated porous structure with all these constituents being de developed decades ago, uh, people have been studying that for, uh, for many years. So there are certain relations between them. In particular, so, yes, please. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of curious. So uh, porous is not the material, but the structure itself or the material. I'm not kind of getting okay. Um, if you're thinking, if you're thinking in terms of moths, for example, it would be, it would be a little bit harder to I mean, I'm sure it can be applied to some extent, but you cannot, if, if you're thinking of MOFs, if you think of porosity on the atomistic level, uh, it's hard to say, okay, this is my solid and this is my cavity, right? It's, it's all one structure. It's hard to imagine the bulk solid material. Uh, so I, when, when showing this picture, uh, of course, that picture stems from the more geological materials where you can say, okay, this is my solid bead. It can be, if it, in case of shale, it's both mineral and, um, and uh, organic matter. Uh, and these are my cavities and there you can, do, you can tell one from another. So, so uh, I mean, at what scale can I introduce like uh, an effective, uh, like I would say, uh, 
parameters for such such material. So if we talk about like several nanometers, that I mean still not kind of homogeneous, I would say material structure. But in terms of I would say uh, like micrometers and maybe bigger, you mentioned like a, a chalk or something like that. So I mean we still can use some effective parameters for for I would say for stiffness or like pressure and stuff like that. So I just just wondering what are the, the size scales for so description. Let's let's do the following. I'll uh, once I get to the picture of the actual material I'll be, um, okay. yeah, I'll sorry. be dealing with, uh, I'll try to to answer your question in more detail because I think it will just the picture will answer because this is a cartoon. We'll have a real well. It, it will be also sort of a drawing, but that drawing is based on on actual material reconstruction. Um, all right. But thank you for the question. And while this is what concerns me, so far we didn't get any questions from the online audience. Uh, They're much smarter than, than me. So. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. Uh, so fluid doesn't have a shear modulus. So if we consider porous media, macroporous media filled with fluid the shear modulus of the entire sample would be the same as the shear modulus of, uh, of the dry sample. And in this case, uh, well, uh, some uh, in the middle of uh, the previous century, people derived this very nice and simple relation between the modulus of the uh, fluid, which is uh, modulus of the material saturated with fluid and the modulus of the material uh, of the dry material porosity phi and uh, the modulus of the fluid and the modulus of the solid grains. Very simple, nice expression. It can be written in terms of the longitudinal modulus as well. It's called Gassman equation. Gassman was the first to, to write it. And then, then uh, well, Buell wrote, uh, Buell wrote a more general expression. Um, so the question is, and this is how, uh, well, one of the questions I, I sort of got into with this research was, is this at all applicable for uh, nanopores medium? And uh, this is something we explored using experimental data and using um, molecular simulations as well. And this is, hopefully this is one of the questions I'm gonna answer uh, by the end of this presentation. All right, so, I'll talk a little bit about experiments. I'm a, I'm a theoretician. Uh, however, well, uh, I try, well, I collaborate a lot with experimentalists and also I try to uh, currently um, build an experimental set setup together with uh, my colleague at NJIT. And uh, we don't have it working yet, but this is, this is sort of the plan. And this setup is not, it's not unique. There, there were measurements like that, and I'm going to be showing these measurements. I wanted first to show how these measurements can be obtained. So, uh, you take you take a porous, porous sample, and it should be a macroscopic porous sample. It should be, well, let's say a cubic centimeter of solid, um, and while you can easily, the routine measurements would be to study adsorption on these um, on these materials. So the uh, you can you can enclose it uh, in a chamber, control the vapor pressure, control the temperature, uh, and, and uh, let certain gas, whatever you want to adsorb in the pores, um, and you can measure the mass of the sample. You can measure how it how it changes, or the volume of the gas adsorption something. So that's that's a routine measurement. Another routine measurement is uh, measuring these elastic properties I've been talking about, right? So you can attach two ultrasonic transducers and you can measure the time it takes for an ultrasonic pulse to go through the sample. From this time you can get the velocity, from the velocity you can get the modulus either longitudinal or shear. Well what is challenging and what's interesting is to see how the wave propagation through the sample changes in the adsorption process. So uh, not, uh, 
uh, not looking at the empty sample, but looking at the sample uh, filled where the pores are filled with the fluid or while well, in the process of filling up these pores. And people have done that. And uh, the first paper of these kind, well, goes back more than 30 years um, yeah, to Warner and Beamish. And they studied the nitrogen absorption, nitrogen, why nitrogen absorption? This is a, a classical method for characterization of porous materials. So, because nitrogen is relatively non-specific gas, it interacts with different surfaces very similarly. And uh, you, from nitrogen absorption, you can mm, calculate from measurement of the nitrogen absorption, you can calculate um, the pore sizes, you can calculate the surface area and so on. So, and they use nitrogen absorption together with ultrasonic measurements on nanopores Viker glass. And while this is where I wanted to show the structure, and this is the structure from, uh, uh, well, based on the computer re reconstruction of the actual, um, based on the experimental measurement. So this is this is structure of Viker glass. The pore sizes, as you can see, well here, uh, they're around well six seven nanometers in diameter. Uh, they're they're channel like pores. They're um, often modeled as cylinders. Uh, well, here I will be representing more, them more like spheres, but uh, they, with the, good, the good thing about these porous material is that it is, first of all, it's monolithic. Many porous materials are hard to synthesize as a monolith. This one is monolithic. Second, the pore size distribution is relatively narrow. So all these channels are roughly the same width. There is no wide distribution. There are no like two peaks in the distribution or something. So these, this is, yeah, this is excellent model material to study nanopores. Yeah, very sorry for interrupting. So I, I just wonder what are the, the uh, well, uh, the speed of sound for such structures? Is it very low or? Oh, no, it's, it's I mean, actually- Typical values. Uh, typical values, hundreds, hundreds if not thousands up to a thousand meter per second okay yeah. so it's like it's it's mostly than, than, yeah, okay. it's mostly keep in mind that this material porous glass it's only about well from these pictures it's uh you can sort of well no it's it's hard to estimate but but these materials are about 30 percent porosity so it's mostly glass 70 percent glass and 30 percent of the voids and then you fill these uh, these uh, voids with liquid, uh, then, well, it's uh, still 70% glass. Yes. Yeah, and a related question, sorry. Um, I know that if you have a, some kind of like maybe porosine, uh, and if you drop it into ultrasound baths, therefore the ultrasound can stimulate the extraction of the solvent, something like that. And did you face with such kind of story when you, uh, um, when you like pass the ultrasound through the porous material, did you expect maybe, did you absorb the, again, as an extraction of the uh, solvent, something like that? And that's, a, that's a good question. I think uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, both frequency and amplitude. So there are experiments where people use ultrasound for absorb, uh, absorbance to simulate either adsorption or desorption. So yes, you could have the, the interaction between the uh, ultrasonic wave, like basically you're shaking your samples yeah, and, yeah. and stimulate and stimulate, well, I think desorption rather than adsorption. Mm -hmm. uh, different frequency, different magnitude. And here we're talking about the frequency on the megahertz, a uh, few megahertz uh, and this, um, uh, in these experiments, there is no effect of ultrasound on adsorption. So if you measure the adsorption isotherm without ultrasound and, or during the ultrasonic experiment, it will be the same. Okay, okay. But yes, there are, it's sort of not something, not something I've, I've looked into, but I've seen, I've seen papers where people 
uh, use ultrasound, ultrasound to sort of shake, shake their adsorbents. All right, uh, nitrogen adsorption. So once again, nitrogen adsorption is the routine method for materials characterization. At 77 Kelvin, you use, you, you use nitrogen gas, you uh, change it um, pressure slowly, letting each point equilibrate. This is uh, called an isotherm, obviously, because the temperature is constant. And uh, what, what is typically measured in these experiments is the, the amount absorbed as a function of the vapor pressure. And this, this is plotted as a relative vapor pressure. And while it, I'm showing just the adsorption branch, if you, you can also do the desorption, it will differ a little bit, but that's a, that's a separate story. So this would be a very typical adsorption isotherm for, for these mesoporous material. All right, this is something which is less typical, and this is these data are uh, coming from the paper by Warner and Beamish, uh, and they measured these wave propagation. So this is the relative change of velocity. I'm not showing the, the absolute value, but uh, just the relative change. And uh, the one immediate observation you can make is that this transverse wave, the transverse velocity looks exactly like the isotherm, just upside down. And this is actually, that was the point of their paper. They wanted, they wanted to use ultrasound to measure isotherms. Well, the reason is obviously the the velocity changes when the when the sample mass is changing, and that's that that was their their point. Well, another well observation they didn't they didn't um, they they weren't uh, unlike me they weren't very excited about it, but they uh, they noticed that the longitudinal velocity changes somehow differently, right? It doesn't have the same shape as the transverse. And from change of the velocity and the change of mass, well, we can calculate the change of the moduli, the shear modulus, which well is not very interesting because the, uh, the shear modulus uh, appears not almost well not changing during during these experiments, all well, which is sort of expected because we're filling the pores with a fluid which doesn't have shear modulus, presumably. What's more interesting is the longitudinal modulus and. Well, we did these calculations um, using well two different ways, uh, from uh, but got relatively uh, similar uh, pictures. So the shear, the longitudinal modulus doesn't change till a certain point. This point on the isotherm, which is called capillary condensation, when the pores are getting filled, and after the capillary condensation, similar to isotherm, which changes quite quite abruptly. This, this changes very abruptly, and then, then it changes gradually after that. While these certainly, certainly there is certain slope. Yes, I know you can tell, well, it's not that many points to, to make it conclusive, but I'll show you a little bit more data to, to make it more conclusive. All right, other data, well, which were uh, appeared uh, later. Um, this, this paper also goes back, well, a couple of, Decades, but this this is a relatively uh, recent paper um, where other authors studied absorption of argon and hexane in in the similar in the similar nanoporous glasses. Again, here shear modulus is not changing. Longitudinal modulus changes while well, not changing until the capillary condensation, then changes abruptly, jumps up, and then you can still see some gradual change here. And this is the desorption branch if you're decreasing the pressure. Yes. Just to show, uh, why do you have a, a deviation of the uh, pressure you need to uh, reach absorption or desorption? What is the reason of these gaps in... Uh, yes, the reasons? Is, yeah, yeah. So uh, in different materials, there could be different reasons for the hysteresis. The main, um, the main mechanism in mesoporous materials is the following. You initially you have you have your you have your pore and you have your let me go back to these adsorption isotherm. Um, initially, you have a layer of gas, layer of fluid absorbing on the pore walls. Imagine imagine your pore is a well, let's say spherical mm -hmm. or a cylindrical cavity, and initially there is a film growing on the walls of these uh, on these cavity. When you increase the pressure gradually. 
right? The thickness of these films getting uh, well, thicker and thicker, and at some point it loses stability. So it's a phase. It's a phase transition. It's all um, in uh, here. You would have a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous filling of the pores. Mm -hmm. Well, which is determined by stability of this film of liquid on the walls. Mm -hmm. If you go back, if you if you decrease the pressure, I didn't show the the desorption branch here, but it would go it would go something like that, right? So there is no well. Uh, in some materials, you can also reach the limit of stability of the filled core, and the hysteresis would be very wide. But typically, uh, the, the transition takes place at the in the equilibrium fashion, and you have an equilibrium meniscus, and uh, basically when the uh, chemical potential, the Gibbs free energy of the of the system with the filled pore and with the empty pore where the film becomes equal. So that's that's why it takes place at a different at a different pressure value. And it's pretty much for any for any pore where you would have these phase transition mechanism, uh, you typically have a hysteresis. So uh, generally uh, so am I right saying that uh, there's a reason of this some kind of like hysteresis and instability. Uh, not stability is some kind of like chemical interaction between uh, gas molecules uh, and gas molecules with each other and with the wall. Uh, yes, yes, and it's well, it's actually in the second part of you know this this discussion, which I decided I'm, I left out uh, oh, from the yeah. seminar. I uh, I have a little bit more details on that, but uh, it's um. It's a very, I would say, it's a very well, it's a very well known thing. What I think, uh, it's just uh, if your film is growing here on the, uh, this is the, this is your wall and this is your liquid film growing, right? So and when your vapor pressure increases. Well, this, this film is getting thicker and thicker. Well, initially, the film is stabilized because because it is it has attracted. Well, the molecules in this liquid film are attracted by the, the solid. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But then you have a um, you have a competing uh, you have a competing mechanism. You have your curved interface inside. You have your surface tension, yep. which. Uh, which makes it, well, once the radius gets too small, makes it unstable. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason you have the uh, capillary condensation is this loss of stability of this film. So, however, when you go backwards, right, when your pore is completely filled here, right, there wouldn't be this picture, right? Mm -hmm. What would be, uh, you would have a certain meniscus well, a pore, obviously, it would have an opening somewhere. And uh, typically, this phase transition on desorption would take place uh, at the, um, when the free energy of this system, of the filled core, equals to the free energy of the same size as the filled. So mm -hmm. it's a different, different uh, energy state. And uh, in in some cases, when the, well, that's a more exotic one, but there are uh, something which has been well, widely discussed in the literature like a decade ago. Uh, there could be like a cavitation uh, transition, and then the streets becomes even wider um, if if the pore pore opening is very small. I'm sorry, just uh, two small questions. So, uh, so it works uh, for uh, this story uh, works for. Um, too many molecules, some, like uh, in a, some classical approximation with too too many molecules inside the pore, isn't it? Um, so if you're yes, this so the materials when we when we describe the pores materials historically there were micro pores materials, huh? meso and macro. So micro is the characteristic pore size less than two nanometers. Meso is between two nanometers 
and 50 nanometers. And macro is about 50 nanometers. And this mechanism is applicable mostly to the mesoporous materials. Well, some of the moth materials are mesoporous. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, many of them are microporous. So in many of them, you wouldn't see these mechanisms, but the absorption isotherm in these cases would look different. From microporous materials, the absorption isotherm typically look like that because it's a gradual pore filling. It's not, it, there is no phase transition. There are no two regimes. Um, and, and of course, all these macroscopic pictures become inapplicable. Yeah, and the second related question. So uh, uh, you have shown like step-like uh, absorption distortion. Mm -hmm. Is it possible uh, to absorb, not like step-like, but some kind of multi-step transition yes. or maybe with a very, very small slope of this process? Is it possible? It's just a question for instance, interest. So you mean that, is it possible to have an isotherm like this. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, um, I mean, they're typically quite smeared, but yes, you could see uh, some fingerprints of two modes of porosity on your isotherms. Mm -hmm. And actually, how these works, and this is this is one area which I didn't even include in my overview. I should have probably, but uh, I spent a number of years working on developing methods for interpretation, for interpretation of absorption data and extracting information on the pore structure from absorption isotherms. And uh, well, one of, the, one of the problems is actually, well, this is an ill post problem. Uh, so there could be different solutions for, well, if you want to say, you take one experimental isotherm and you take a bunch of model isotherms and you want to, to find what the pore size distribution is, well, there is no unique solution and uh, it's, it's, it's quite challenging, let's put it that way. But yes, there are isotherms with, uh, uh, with, with the signs of different modes of porosity. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I, uh, I appreciate your questions. Uh, so, going back here, and this is why I wanted to show hexane in particular, because hexane had this um very pronounced uh, region where the modulus the longitudinal modulus after the capillary condensation or before the capillary evaporation so the modulus gradually changes so if if for nitrogen it was just three points for argon it's just a little bit more here it's it's a clear indication that something is something non-trivial is going on here all right and so, yes before we move forward so I, i'm just wondering uh, not in terms of like fundamental effect, but in terms of possible applications. So the 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 amount of effect is roughly like several percent. So I wonder, is it possible to to use this for some I would say applications, I don't know, for detection or stuff like that? Uh, yes, uh, and it's actually uh, well these the. It's a very, it's a very good question. For shales specifically, the porosity is low, so the effect would be even weaker. Uh, however, these ultrasonic methods are, um, they're precise enough, so even the small effect could be measurable. Uh, and if you could use it, for example, on, on samples and, uh, and from this extract additional information on the pore sizes where other methods could be challenging. That's that's important. Plus, um, the right interpretation of the of the wave propagation data, uh, while it it costs a lot of money, right? It's uh, so so even even small effect would matter. Yeah. But but yes, that's uh, the the um, the change in the modulus is small, and the reason it's small is actually because the modulus of the solid dominates over overall. It's just uh, compared to solid, it's a, uh, it's quite, it's quite a small, it's unfortunately quite a, quite a small change, but easily measurable in various of these, uh, experiments. Okay. Um, uh, I'll show you where uh, these, these effect is expected to be quite, quite strong. Okay. Um, 
the well shifting shifting the gear from experiments to simulations i want to relate this to something we can routinely calculate in molecular simulations and uh we typically uh, one of the one of the properties we deal with is an isothermal compressibility, which is reciprocal of the of the modulus. And uh, in particular, in the um, grand canonical thermodynamic ensemble, uh, where we fix the chemical potential volume and the temperature and change the number of particles, this is the natural ensemble to model the absorption process. Because in an absorption experiment, you change you change the number of molecules in your Four, right? So here, here it's the same, uh, but in silico. So in these ensemble, you can calculate the compressibility from the fluctuations of number of particles, uh, and from that you can relate it to the uh, to the modulus, uh, well, uh, isothermal and adiabatic. And this this way, although this this is strictly speaking, this is this formula is derived for the bulk fluid. It's been widely used for uh, prediction of compressibility and confinement and um, well sort of uh, there, there are limitations on its use uh, related to the distribution of these uh, fluctuations. If it's if the pore is too small, if the system is too small, you cannot get a Gaussian distribution and then of course these, this is questionable. But even for the pore size of roughly two nanometers, well, uh, you can you can get a nice uh, Gaussian distribution. So for all these mesoporous materials, this um, this approach works. Okay, so the system the system I'm uh, I'm illustrating here is the system of nitrogen at seventy seven Kelvin, but we've we've done calculations for other fluids, argon, methane, of course, uh, which is more of interest for the geological applications, but I, I wanted to show the comparison with these nitrogen data. So nitrogen has been modeled for many years. It can be described, uh, it can be described with a simple Leonard Jones potential, very simple model. And um, while it's, I'm showing just the fluid part, the solid is modeled as an external, as external potential. We use the Monte Carlo method uh, in the Grand Canonical Ensemble. Uh, we use well quite um, quite large number of moves, both equilibration and production, and the, all the parameters we take. So in molecular simulation, well, obviously uh, one of the one of the main things is what parameters to use. And here we didn't we didn't invent anything. We take we took the parameters which are widely used in literature for describing nitrogen uh, absorption in silica materials. While well, this is porous glass, so what we got the first thing is uh, absorption isotherms. And I'm showing here the isotherms for various pore sizes because we varied the pore size to sort of see how how the effect would be different. I'm showing just the adsorption branch. We could uh, hypothetically get this desorption branch, and the hysteresis uh, didn't didn't do that. Um, and well, what is it's a very this is something done routinely, and this is very well known. The, the isotherms in the smaller pores, right? This is where you don't have these phase transition, which which looks like the the gradual feeling at the low pressure, and then for larger pores, there's more and more pronounced phase transition with these capillary condensation. Uh, then what we did differently, so that's predicting isotherms. People have been doing this for 30 years at least. Uh, but what we did differently for each point in our isotherm, we took, we took this point and we calculated the distribution uh, of the number of molecules well, during our simulation, and for all of these, for all of these data, we got nice Gaussian distributions from which we can calculate uh, the variance of this distribution, which gives us the compressibility. Yes. I'm sorry, distribution where in the pore inside the pore inside. inside yes. So, so if you have kind of like uh, I'm sorry, if you have a uh, eight nanometer pore, mm -hmm. and therefore inside you can face with uh, 1,200 molecules inside. Roughly, 
Yes, it's it's nitrogen. It's a tiny molecule. Oh, wow. So, and and if if we take a if we take a spherical pore, that's that's what we get. Uh, so for smallest for smallest pores here, and this is where actually statistics becomes uh, worsening, is um, roughly two nanometers would have I think roughly 50, 50 molecules inside. So it's a, it's a big difference. And below two nanometers, I'm not going to be showing any results because they stop making sense. They the distribution becomes non-Gaussian, and we're not sure whether you can interpret these fluctuations while in uh, uh, in terms of compressibility. Yes, so I just wonder does like mo do molecules just mechanically go into the pores? I mean, okay, the, this is this is one of the slides I threw threw out. So what what's what's happening? What's happening here uh, with uh, in molecular simulation, right? Uh, we have a certain volume which we set. We set the uh, energy profile, so energy of solid fluid. So, in, in each molecule which we put here, it interacts with a certain, you know, depending on its coordinate, it interacts with certain, certain energy. And what we do in the Monte Carlo simulation, we randomly displace the molecules, right? And we also randomly exchange the molecules with an imaginary reservoir. Mm -hmm. So we insert and remove, insert and remove till we reach certain equilibrium. Because the, the insertion and removals are done based on the well, statistical mechanics criteria. Uh, and is it like a really time consuming calculation? Yes, it is a really time consuming because it's hard to make it. Uh, it parallel and serial calculations. And uh, the reason, for example, I'm showing eight nanometers and I'm not showing larger pores, because even with eight nanometers, in order to collect decent statistics, I would say it's um, two, three weeks calculations. Yeah. Hope there are like no bugs in the code. <laughs> well, that's obviously, well, first of all, to calculate isoterms, it's not, it's not that long, right? And also you can, this, each point can be calculated separately. So if you have, you know, 100 processors, 100 cores, right? Uh, you, can, you can run one isoterm very quickly with 100 points in it, right? Uh, the, problem, the problem is when you need to know the average, you don't need to run it for too long. When you need to get this whole distribution, you actually need to, uh, to be patient, and that's a well. That's in general, that's a challenge of the Monte Carlo simulation. Molecular dynamics is typically much faster because it's it's easily parallelizable. Uh, not so. Not much much. Just maybe to clarify, I mean, of course, like microscopic pores are are larger, mm -hmm. but still you have to uh, for meso and micro you have to take into account maybe uh, well more more like effects because while you're approaching to smaller scales, some more difficult probably physics appear. So what is the, the most time consuming? I would, I would bet probably on micro if they weren't that small in my, you mentioned like 50 molecules. So in terms of the effects, and this is what's, what's important in terms of the use of molecular simulation. Uh, well, for us looking from a macroscopic point of view, we can say, oh, there is, we can split them. This is this classification. It, it appeared many, many decades ago before molecular simulation appeared. But, um, so, and that was based on this observation. Okay, these isotherms look like this with a fixed transition. These isotherms look differently, right? And the border between these two isotherms is roughly around two nanometers. And we call these micro, these call these meso. And actually, this this one is where the isoterm actually um, doesn't have these capillary condensation. The condensation, the filling takes place at the separation pressures if it's above. So there's no, uh, well, pretty much no interesting effects. So in terms of molecular simulation, there is no difference between them other than the, the size. Well, we can, with a simple system like that, like porous glass and nitrogen, all we need to set, we need to set the solid fluid potential, which is no electrostatics, it's just Leonard Jones um, potential, 
uh, integrated over the surface, um, or well, for you can you can do it without the integration. You could say, okay, I have my oxygen from silica here, and each oxygen would be interacting with each of the nitrogen molecule uh, there, well, based on Leonard Jones potential. And the only difference between eight nanometer and two nanometer is just well the the number of oxygen sites we get. That's that's all the and the volume we have. So uh, fundamentally, they're they're absolutely the same. But the physics, which we microscopic physics, which we will get as a result, like these absorption isotopes, would be different. Um, yeah. Both describe with the same method. But thank you. I yeah, uh, thanks, appreciate Bob. your questions. Um, so uh, I. This is one of the way to calculate it. Another way to calculate the compressibility is actually from the slope of the isotherms. And I, I think, I don't know how I, I was, uh, how am I doing in terms of time? Because I can skip this slide and- uh, I mean, I'm not sure if we're very much limited, but- Okay, I mean, okay, I can, I can, you know, I'll, I'll discuss it. So the, uh, the problem why I thought I can skip it in order to introduce this slide, I need to introduce the concept of the salvation pressure. So we have vapor pressure, right? And uh, we have the chemical equilibrium between, well, and presumably mechanical equilibrium as well, between the fluid in the pore and the gas around this, this pore system. However, for the fluid inside the pore for these, well, it could be liquid film, it could be filled pore, um, we can actually introduce a different pressure value uh, than the vapor pressure. Well, the manifestation of these uh, solvation pressure effect is actually in particular in these adsorption induced deformation I briefly mentioned in the beginning of my talk. So if you look at porous material, um, you know, and uh, again, going back to these pine cone example, right? The vapor pressure in the atmosphere would be miserably small, it would be several kilopascals, right? And this vapor is in equilibrium with the fluid which absorbs in the porous structure, but the mechanical stresses which are caused, caused by this fluid in the absorbed state are huge so that they can deform the, uh, the solid. And uh, this driving force for this deformation, we call it salvation pressure. So uh, if we look at the at the um, compressibility, of course, well, we're looking at the compressibility of these absorbed fluids so that it should be calculated based not on the vapor pressure, not the derivative on the vapor pressure, but derivative on the salvation pressure in the pore. Um, so then I, I assume that for my mesopores, uh, the, well, they will, they're macroscopic enough so I can apply the Gibbs to GAM equation and relate pressure with a change of chemical potential. Just rewrite these uh, derivative um, a little bit differently. And then finally, if while well, the vapor pressure is low, right, I can say, well, my nitrogen, obviously, nitrogen at 77 Kelvin has a pressure of uh, one bar, so I can say it's an ideal gas and write the chemical potential of the ideal gas. And then my compressibility or modulus will be calculated from the slope of the absorption isotope. So N is the well, number density, P over P naught is that relative pressure which I plotted on this plot. So very simple way to calculate this compressibility from the same isotherms without counting the fluctuations. You still need the isotherms though, of course. Um, so this plot, uh, this plot shows the uh, modulus for the fluid in pores of different size as a function of uh, relative vapor pressure. So these are the calculations based on that isotherms. The solid lines are based on the fluctuations formula and the dashed lines are based on these just numerical derivative taking, taking the slope. So which clearly they match. Well, what's interesting here is this dashed line. The dashed line shows the value of the modulus of the bulk fluid. So first of all, we can immediately see that the moduli deviate from the bulk. The moduli depend on pressure 
while and they actually depend on the pore size. And they look even more um, instructive if we plot them in the log scale instead of vapor pressure, we plot them as a function of logarithm of the pressure or Laplace pressure, capillary pr pressure, which is logarithm of the vapor pressure times the gas constant temperature in molar volume. And in this case, you can see that all these, all these moduli uh, dependencies turn into linear dependencies. Furthermore, with the same slope, well, but a different intercept. And uh, well, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to look here uh, where that here, this P Laplace equals zero corresponds to P equals P naught. So where, um, where the Laplace pressure vanishes, so the pore is filled. So, so it should behave, you know, should behave. I, I don't want to say it should behave like bulk, it should not. But, uh, but uh, we can see that even when Laplace pressure is zero, the moduli are still different for different pore sizes. And that, uh, well, if I take the end point of each of these dependencies and plot that as a function of the pore size, this is where this is it where it becomes really interesting. So the molecular simulation predicts that the bulk modulus of the nitrogen in the well adsorbed state in the in the pore, uh, the modulus of this nitrogen depends on the pore size. As one of the uh, as a linear function of one of the pore size. Furthermore, the dotted line is the bulk value. So for for pore sizes like in these Viker glass, where where the pore is roughly six seven nanometers, we're here, right? Only only small uh, small deviation from the bulk is just slightly stiffer. But once we go to smaller pores the deviation from the bulk properties become much larger. And here it's only, it's almost, almost three times difference compared to the, uh, to the modulus of the bulk fluid. So mm -hmm. this, this is plotted in terms of like absolute values, but uh, in terms of like uh, relative uh, value, what is the, the amount of this effect? So, this. so that, that's from zero, right? So this is the bulk. Value. Oh yeah, makes sense. Yes. And this Twice is like triple. Two, two, yeah. two, oh, yeah. two, you know, this is zero point three. This is zero point almost zero point nine. Yeah, almost. Right? Yeah, that's that's a huge thing. Well, I uh, I have in my if if we want, I can later show you in the backup slides. I have the calculations for supercritical methane. For supercritical methane, these effects in in carbon pores, and this is what's of interest again for the. Uh, for the petroleum applications, the effect is a uh, factor of seven. Because supercritical super critical methane is much more uh, compressible, the modulus is much lower, and it appears to be much more sensitive to these, um, uh, to, to the confinement effects. So, so, so I mean, uh, what's the, the bigger the pore, yeah, what's the physics? The bigger the pore, the closer it's to bulk. But what is the, the, the limit, I would say? Would it saturate somewhere or? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I, I, I've been asked these questions several times and I've, every time I promise myself, oh, I need to, I need to finish these calculations. So uh, obviously, obviously the, um, uh, the number of molecules in the pore scales like the pore size cube, right? Yes. And then the, well, actually the, uh, calc the length of the calculation scales like square of At that. Least, yeah. so. so going from eight nanometers, which I said, well, roughly two weeks, right? Going from eight nanometers to something like 10, 15 and so on. It's, you know, it's progressively longer and longer and it's more and more annoying. My former PhD student, Max, uh, he, I think he had some data for maybe 14 nanometers, which pretty much matched the bulk value. Okay. Uh, but we didn't get any further and we didn't, you know, it's sort of a little bit, um, we decided that 
yes, it would be maybe nice, but what, what are we going to do? What, are we going to write a paper about, about just two points or three points? Because it's a lengthy calculation, and I don't think we will get much, much new physical insight. But I, I agree with you. It would be nice to see it. So I, although I'm showing here these linear fit, I don't think the points will actually go below the bulk value. I think this, this, the, the closer we get to zero, which is the bulk limit, right? I think uh, the, the, we will see, we'll start seeing the deviation from the linear trend. Yeah. Just a related question. So am I right in that K is uh, compressibility? K is the modulus. It's one over compressibility. Beta is the compressibility. So. This larger K means stiffer. Uh -huh. So in the smaller pores, the fluid becomes stiffer. And I will in the next slide, I will uh, I will answer the question about the physics. Mm -hmm. So why why we see these effect? Okay. So that's one of the answers. That's a, that's a physics based answer for for these for these question. And. Uh, it's it's a little bit sort of it's, it simplifies it a little bit, but but it's um, I think uh, I think it, it explains it at least for for the system we're dealing with. So if you look, go from the from the macroscopic picture back to microscopic picture, right? In order to get each point in our adsorption isotherm, we actually calculate the density in the pore. And you can look at the pro density profile in the pore. So bulk liquid would be just these oscillations, right? Uh, if, it's, um, if we confine the, uh, the liquid in the pore, we will have a sharp peak of the density near the pore wall. Because this is the first layer, the first absorbed layer it's clearly well densified by the adsorption by the solid fluid interaction. So this this peak uh, it uh, of course contributes to the overall density. So and well, furthermore, this peak well makes this layer much uh, stiffer. So the in the large pore, obviously one these these initial peak does not change the properties of the fluid overall much. But if you go to the pore, which is small, which is, well, this, these are in reduced coordinates. And I think this is for, I think it's maybe two and a half or three nanometer pore. Uh, so for smaller pores, contribution of these surface layers to the overall properties of the fluid in the pore would be quite substantial. And uh, the deviation of Elasticity, the deviation of these um, uh, elastic modulus in the pore uh, would be quite large, and uh, well, obviously, it gradually changes. Right, the smaller the pore, the stronger is the effect. That's one explanation. That's microscopic explanation. There is also more sort of um, empirical explanation, if you wish. Um, so we know that when fluid is Absorbed in the pore, it's under what is known salvation pressure, right? So uh, that it, salvation pressure includes two terms. Laplace pressure is this what we have below uh, below the saturation, below p equals um, p naught. So this this term which I uh, showed before, and another term PSL which is related to the solid liquid. Uh, solid liquid interactions. Uh, and this term is harder to calculate it, but it's it's kids like one over the pore size. And we actually, we, we calculated that in uh, one of the earlier papers. And while well, this term scales is one of the pore size, but the modulus of the liquid, if forget about, if we forget about the pore, just think of the modulus of the bulk liquid. Uh, at moderate pressures, it's a constant. But once we go to high pressures, well, the modulus changes. It's actually uh, what is known as tate mernigan equation. You can write your modulus as a function of pressure. It's just a simple uh, Taylor series in pressures. And uh, well, if the pressure is high, but not extremely high, you can limit it with a linear term. So you have this linear function of the pressure 
And the pressure itself scales like one over the pore size. So the modulus becomes a linear function of one over the pore size. Yeah, yes. yes, I love the physics since the, the equations are very similar. If you're talking about like mechanics, optics, electromagnetics, they're I'm pretty similar. I'm just wondering, what is the sign of this uh, alpha? It can be greater than zero, less than zero, depending it's, on the material. So it's there is no. It's positive. I, I have not seen. I have not seen. So negative would mean you know you compress something and it becomes softer. I'm sure. I'm sure there. You know there could be there. Hypothetically, we could come up with a situation to imagine that with maybe some like for a solid. Or I, I don't know, but but in general, of course, you compress something, let it be liquid, right? And it becomes even stiffer because you compress it, you move the molecules closer to each other, and it becomes stiffer. And well, the fun fact about the South, again, I couldn't include everything in this presentation, but um, if if I go back, uh, I want to go back to this plot. This alpha is the same for all pore sizes. So the slope yeah, is the, the slope same. You mentioned it, yeah. And furthermore, this slope is the same as for bulk liquid. And if you know the modulus itself is affected, the slope is not. And therefore, this sort of second derivative property, or would it be, well, if can say maybe third derivative, but the, the, no, the slope property is something more universal. Well, uh, I don't want to make it a universal claim, but for different liquids, these alphas are quite similar as well. And this is, well, this is not my observation. It's for bulk liquids, people observe that for simple, for simple, relatively simple liquids, not water, water would be different, but for, for many liquids, it's, it has the, roughly the value of like eight or 10. Uh, for water, it's smaller. But anyway, um, yeah, the equations are indeed simple and uh, yeah, the parameters are quite easy to calculate. So, well, uh, I started from these nitrogen data. I wanted to show a comparison. It's not the best comparison because we uh, did not predict the point of Kepler condensation right because we used a spherical pore, pore model and not cylindrical cylindrical pore model would give probably the Kepler condensation around maybe here, maybe even a little bit further. Well, not exactly what they have in experiment, but we got the trend and we got the slope right using the Gassman equation. So to cal we calculated the properties from molecular simulation, we use this solid properties and we use these Gassman equation, which was sort of questionable. Uh, and we got quite close to what people saw in the experiments. I have a, even a better picture, this picture on the left, where we used, uh, where we used Gassman equation, we used molecular simulation and compared the prediction of the change of the longitudinal modulus of argon in the pores of, uh, of Viker glass to the, mm, to the mm, yeah to the experimental data. Well, I, I just wanted to say we have we have two curves uh, here uh, because while there is certain uncertainty uh, with regard to the properties of the porous uh, not porous solid but the KS property, and that's that's why we have two sort of calculations. And uh, for hexane, we didn't do molecular simulations, but we. Uh, we use our well these simple simple equations to estimate the salvation pressure and to calculate these uh, these lines while using using basically this algebra. So overall, and this that was a pretty good message which we published together with my collaborator Boris Gurevich, um, who is a geophysicist. We we published that in geophysics research letters uh, a few years back. So. With that, I'm coming to the conclusions. And the first is a uh, combined ultrasonic adsorption experiment, provide information on the elastic moduli of fluids adsorbed in the pores. So something, a very simple, well, simple in some sense method to probe the properties of confined fluids with purely macroscopic measurements. Shear modulus of confined fluid is zero, as in bulk fluids. Longitudinal modulus differs from the bulk and depends on the adsorbate pressure. Isothermal compressibility or modulus of a fluid can be calculated from fluctuations of number of particles using conventional grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations. 
the modulus changes logarithmically with the pressure. The modulus is a linear function of the one of the pore size. It's affected by the salvation pressure. And while well, the main thing we see that with the limited experimental data we have from the literature, well, our, our results are quite close. And well, uh, this is why we actually, uh, well, I decided to go into experiments because we wanted to measure that for the pore sizes, which are smaller. We wanted to see if we can see stronger effects in other materials. And that's, that's our main plan now. Yes. I'm sorry, I have a question. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you have made the elastic modeling and compressibility for the adsorbed molecules or confined molecules. Fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, fluids or molecules. Uh, does that mean that uh, you fixed, you have fixed the uh, mechanical parameters of the hosting substrate? Yes. yes. So you neglect the effect of uh, adsorbance on the initial properties of the host? Yes. Okay. yes. Excellent question. Yeah, and I know where you're getting, getting with this. Yes. Uh, and however, this is possible to do looking at the both solid and fluid and especially if it's in like atomistic solids like moth yeah but but in this model we looked only at the fluid having solid as an external potential well the main reason the main reason is um well there there are two reasons first uh in monte carlo it would be you know it would be hard to, to, to do that. You can basically, you cannot use these equations to calculate both the properties of the solid and the fluid. You would need to calculate the modulus using a different method. In particular, uh, you can simulate the compression, right? You can take a piece, of uh, a piece of solid, fill it with liquid and simulate the compression, or you calculate the elastic constants, um, which probably would you know, work. But that should be done in molecular dynamics rather than Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. which is not, which is, I mean, it, it will probably even make it easier. But we started from that since we were based off uh, yeah. isotherms calculations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, that's sort of it. And I just wanted to show, to show the group picture, well, extended group picture, once again, showing that, saying that while well, there is an opportunity to join the team, I have two openings right now. So either PhD or postdoctoral positions. Uh, and uh, well, there is, there is one option for purely modeling and another option for both experiments and modeling. Well, these in particular, these ultrasonic experiments, which uh, we're planning to run. Thank you very much for the attention. I mean, thanks a lot for, for for accepting the invitation to give a talk. I mean, very exciting results, very inspiring talk. So with that, I would like to thank you once again. And guys, we still have probably some time for a discussion. So, uh, especially those who are in the Zoom. So please raise your hands or type in the question. So- I guess guys from Zoom, they're quite shocked about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I probably still have some questions. There may be some pretty much general. So when you're talking about something porous, like nanoporous, or maybe uh, like even several tens of nanometers porous, and some liquids including inside. So I'm thinking of like human bones. So that's that's macro pores, okay. of course. These are all all so all natural. Like, no, no, I don't want to say all natural pores are mocker pores, but uh, I biological, I think they're all mocker pores. But all natural, you know, if we think of natural materials, clays and zeolites obviously are nanopores. This thing that you make something like porous and it's become more, more like stiffer or uh, like it can, uh, I would say, uh, well, it's something I would say, it might sound counterintuitive, but I, I would say that it's something natural. So the bones are probably porous, but still they can, they can, as far as I know, like some human bones, they can, uh, well, suffer from like 1.5 tons or something like that, like from actual, actual like uh, weight or like.
pressures. So this is something kind of difficult to to realize, but still, this is I think very very natural and beautiful result. So I mean, I'm a bit shocked. So. But uh, yeah. Just maybe a question concerning uh, the, this stiffer uh, parameter for absorbed gas inside a quite sm small pore. What's the physical reason of gas to be more stiffer inside a quite quite nanoscale uh, pores? Uh, why do we have this effect? Because it's some kind of like a classical model uh, you've built uh, this uh, model based on like classical equations mm -hmm. and why do we have this uh, non-classical behavior? Okay, so if we think macroscopically, right, uh, even if we think macroscopically, let's say I have my pore, which is, let's, let me take two pores, one is small, one is larger. All right, and then molecules get absorbed there, and uh, the first layer of molecules, because because of the well, absorption means it's more favorable energetically for them to be on the surface rather than interacting with their neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone wants to be on the surface, and the first layer becomes very very dense, right? Mm -hmm because it's dense, it's also stiffer, right? Well, the same thing we have here, et cetera. I will yeah. get tired of drawing. <laughs> so the contribution, so this is a volumetric property and the contribution of one layer, if you're in two nanometer four, the weight of this stiff layer with respect to the, the entire volume, would be much greater than the, uh, the, the same for, let's say, five millimeter pore. And of course, if you have a huge pore, right, like a large one, and you have just one layer there, but it's like 20 nanometers, this layer almost does not matter. So uh, the, the smaller the pore is, the more, uh, the more pronounced the role of the stiff layer by the wall. And I'm saying one layer, it's actually the second layer is also, it's also uh, affected. So you can see these density in the second layer as well. And uh, do you consider the geometry of the molecule when you make a calculation? Because uh, geometry also can play uh, uh, some kind of effect on this pack. Absolutely. So this is this is an excellent question, and this is actually um, uh, this is something we're working on right now with more interesting molecules because we we've done calculations for nitrogen, which is well N two, but you can still model it with one sphere. Okay. Uh -huh. Then we did it for uh, argon. That's one sphere. We did it for. Uh, methane, and we use two different models for methane because methane again, it's uh, you can model methane uh, as one sphere, or you can model it with these uh, hydrogen explicitly. We model it with explicit hydrogens and show that the there is no difference, but it's still it's a very simple model. So we're looking into something a little bit more complicated uh, to see what's what what would be the case there. Because well, this these also pretty much well, except for uh, for the met methanes with explicit hydrogens, they don't involve electrostatics, right? And once you get electrostatics involved, and you have electrostatics on the surface, it will will bring many more interesting phenomena there. The question for me now, the main thing is, you know, I can predict with molecular simulations quite a lot of things, but I don't think it's you know, it's, a, it's informative unless I have an experimental confirmation for that. So I'm more, I'm more right now interested in, uh, in getting, well, more experimental data to, to prove that. Because that, that wasn't, that was only the simulation result. This is how I understand it, but it was not, it was not confirmed experimentally. And just uh, uh, last question for me can tell this story. So I'm not so familiar with the theory uh, how the compressibility can be converted to the other 
properties of molecule absorb molecules but i guess for sure that uh when you change the compressibility of the molecule and you see the uh, well packed molecules uh, this effect can uh, this uh, certain uh, strong effect on uh dialect properties of the molecules uh and other i don't know uh okay conductive optical and other story so is it possible from you to extract another uh properties from this compressibility good question um i would i would need to look more specifically in in, in these properties, I, I I think I think we can predict quite a lot of other things. Uh, yeah, what the, yeah, so how we can estimate these things? What is it exactly? So and can we uh, confirm uh, your results ba based like on dialectic measurements or something like that? Well, since here here there is no well for these systems there is no electrostatics. It's I don't think it will be. You know something to look at but for the systems which involve electrical charges that's something that's something we might we might want to look into that's that would be actually quite interesting to, to predict different electric properties yeah because of course you know certain arrangements certain orientation and so on that that must affect it well but when we have well, electrostatic interactions also the surface matters more because the surface, you know, you don't want to model the surface as a uniform thing. You might want to model it on a precise atomistic details with all the charges on the surface and so on. And that's, that could that could give quite quite a number of interesting interesting effects. But that's something that's something sort of worth worth discussing in, in detail. Yeah. Okay. You guys so as far as i i see there are no further questions with that i would like to express i would say huge gratitude towards professor gore for i mean for outstanding presentation and thanks a lot for this clarification and uh, well with that i would like to uh close the seminar and guys see you around take care and bye bye thank you thank you